conference, three or four day teaching time where um, I had to go through a, a really in-depth personality test. Um, and and they, I, have a, I have a three ring binder um, of results from that test and from that time I spent as part of the seminar that I went to. And um, going through it, I kind of realized that and there's some, maybe I've got split personalities. <laughs> maybe I've got something wrong with me. And at one of the breaks, I went up to the instructor and I said, hey, you know, we, we talked about this and that one of my personality traits is the fun-loving, let's just have fun, let's just laugh. You know, who cares if we accomplish anything? Let's just have a good time. That's one of my, my strongest personality traits. Shocker. Um, the other part of my, the other really, like, there's the fun part, and then there's this other part of my personality that's, like, just below it that is the serious kind that is, let's just get something done, you know, let's, you know, I, I can plow over people, it's like, you know, suck it up, buttercup, you know, we're, we're going to get this done, and we're going to, you know, accomplish, and we're going to be task-oriented and task focused and task driven. I said, how do these two things match? And the instructor go, oh, we call that a me, me complex. <laughs> You're in conflict with each other all the time because you want to have fun, but then you get irritated because you're not getting stuff accomplished. Or if you're getting stuff done, you're irritated with yourself because you're not having fun. And so you have this me, me complex where you're constantly at odds with yourself. The convenient thing is, is I can blame the other person. <laughs> no, but, well, we had fun, <laughs> had a good time, um, or we got a lot done. You know, I, can, I can blame myself and I can blame the other person. Um, I am what I am. And sometimes I'll tell Becky, I'm really sorry for the way I am. <laughs> I just, I, 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 I apologize for that. Um, I, I, I learned this from Becky too. Um, she's a social worker and there's this thing that she says and she, she operates in and she talks to people and I learned it and I try to apply it to life and it's assume positive intent. When you're dealing with somebody else, you assume positive intent. So sometimes I have to assume positive intent with myself. You know, I, I have good intentions, and I'm assuming positive intent. And about you, I'm going to assume positive intent. And I'm going to assume whatever you do, you have good intentions, whether you really do or not. And I'll probably figure it out later whether your intentions are good or not. But I'm going to assume positive intent, and I'm going to assume the best of you. I'm going to assume your intentions, your desire, your heart is in the right place. Even if what we're doing isn't right, even if we're making mistakes, even if we don't realize what we're doing is wrong, I'm going to assume your intentions are good, and then I can have a conversation with you, and maybe we can talk about what you're doing and whether what your behavior is positive or right or not, but I'm going to start with the assumption that your intentions are good, and we're going to work through some of the other stuff. If it's not right, we can, we can work through that, but one of the hardest things is, to, is, is self-realization of whether my intentions, I know my intentions are right, but is my behavior right, and is my attitude right, even if my intentions are right, and that self-examination is really difficult to be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and evaluate our motives, evaluate our actions, evaluate our behavior, because inside we know our intentions are good, even if our actions aren't. You know, where our intentions may be, you know, to not be angry, but everything about our face and our tone of voice says something different. Right? I'm not mad. What are you bossing me around for? Our, our intentions may be good, but we may not have the self-awareness of our behavior. We may not have the self-awareness of our attitudes, of our tone of voice. And, and to really look in the mirror is a difficult thing. 
And as we talk about faith, family, and flip-flops, and next week we're wrapping this series up, um, self-awareness and, and, and looking in the mirror and evaluating our behavior, evaluating our life is incredibly important. As we look at our faith and as we look at our life and as we look at parenting or grandparenting or, or mentoring or influencing one another, the, the self-awareness is critically important. Um, because we can look at our kids and wonder why our kids are the way they are when we don't realize how we are. You know, I've told you my, my driving habits and the attitude I can have when I'm driving, and is it, would, it, would it be any wonder if my kids yell at other drivers? I've told you about my anger issues growing up and the temper that I had. Would it be any wonder if my kids have that response? And it's easy for me to blame them. It's easy for me to get upset with them. It's easy for me to, to, to tell them to stop if I don't have self-awareness about what I am and that maybe they get it from me and nuts don't fall far from the tree. The saying, I think, is apples, but I like to use nuts because it's more accurate. <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But this idea of being self-aware is critically important to our faith, that we look in the mirror. We, for generations, one generation has criticized the next generation. We hear that all the time today. Oh, the stinking lazy generation. They're so lazy. They, they can't keep a job. They don't, they don't stay at a job. You know, they're always on their phones. They're always doing this. And I want to say, who raised them? We can go back to generations and, I, and we hear it. You know, well, yeah, but this generation is really bad. This generation is, this, this, this not, we are, you know what? Your parents said the same thing about you. Yeah, you can go back and um, I remember my dad saying, my mom wanted to throw my radio out the window because <laughs> of the music. I mean, we go back and the people, you know, back at the turn of the century and then the roaring 20s hit and all the flapper girls. Can you imagine what mothers were having heart attacks back in their home because their daughter was a flapper girl and they were out in the whole prohibition thing? And then that generation grows up when we have World War II and then we have the 50s and oh my goodness, the rock and roll of the 50s and 60s. That is horrible music. You know, Elvis and his hips and just changing things. And then that generation said something about our generation and our generation saying something about the next generation. We constantly blame. We constantly kick the can down the road and we don't look in the mirror and say, I raised those kids. That doesn't mean their behavior is okay, but this whole idea of self-examination, and the same thing is true in our faith. Well, it's the church's fault. We constantly look for somebody else to blame. We constantly look for somebody else to fault. Well, the church doesn't teach this, and the church doesn't teach that, and the church doesn't say this, and the Sunday school teacher didn't say that. I, you know, I, I've had um, a lot of... I, a lot of people, and I'll be honest, it hasn't happened here, okay? So when I say this, I'm not blaming anybody here. But over the years, I've had a lot of suggestions for sermons. You know, you really need to talk on this. You should really talk about that. Oh, the church, we don't hear anything about this anymore. You need to talk about that. And you don't talk about families, or you don't talk about heaven, or you don't talk about hell, or you don't talk about this, or you don't talk about that. I figure, okay. There's 52 weeks in a year, right? And I get vacation, and I'm going to take my vacation. So you knock off four weeks there. We have some special speakers. You knock off a couple weeks there. Maybe we have a, a snow day, and we don't have a church on that Sunday. And, and then, you know, some of you don't come every Sunday. You never notice that? You're not here every week either. So if we get to have this same conversation, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I stand up here and talk 44, 45 times a year. Let's just, for the sake of argument. There are 66 books in the Bible. 
all the verses and chapters, we can't cover everything in church, but yet so often we want to blame the church for our problems. Is it the church's fault or do we need to start looking in the mirror? Now, I'm not saying the church isn't at fault. Don't get me wrong. The church has lots of warts and carries a significant amount of blame. But we have to start in the mirror. And we don't always like what we see. Let's take a look at Psalm chapter 39. Psalm, the biggest book in the Bible. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to take them out. I want you to um, get out your phones, uh, get your pens out. There's a, this is an amazing chapter. Um, I'm, we're not going to read it all, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but I, I like to write in my Bible. I've got notes in my Bible here where one section that talks about God's omniscience. The other one talks about his omnipresence, and the other one talks about his omnipotence. So there's this whole passage that we're not going to read that talks about who God is in his power and his authority and his ability. This is great. If you can use the Bible in the chair in front of you, highlight right in it, it's fine. But we're going to read uh, the first six verses of chapter, of chapter 139, and then we're going to skip down to the end of the chapter, okay? So this first part, David writing, writes this. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. That ought to terrify some of us. That God knows everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, every place you go. David says, you know all of this. You know this. So we're going to jump down to the end of the chapter. We're going to read verses 23 and 24. David writes this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. David's desire was to be known by God and to be revealed. Any weakness, God, point it out in me. I mean, we don't like to be told things that are wrong in our life, do we? Does anybody really enjoy when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know, you're really being a knob. And you're really being a jerk. And you're not just saying, you're not just being honest, you're being a jerk. I mean, we don't like to hear that because our intentions tend to be good. Our, our motivations tend to be, and in our own mind at least, tend to be positive. David is saying, oh God, please, I want to be so much like you. Please point out anything in my life, anything, no matter how small, God, you have permission to point it out in my life. To say, hey David, you need to stop this and you need to change this. David, you can't act like this. David, don't do this. And we could point to David's life and we could point out some really obvious things. I mean, he murdered somebody. He had an affair. He did all these horrible things, yet David's heart is crying out to God and saying, God, please, please reveal yourself to me and reveal myself to me. Point out those blind spots and those shadows and those things that I, I don't understand and I can't see. God, point them out in my life. He's begging God for this. There's a, there's a verse that I like that's one of my favorite verses. It's uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. And in this passage, it's coming from uh, where David and his mighty men, all of their families and everything had been taken captive. Everything had been removed from them. And they were out at war and they came back to their camp and their camp was empty because they had uh, come in and they had been, all, the entire camp had been kidnapped. And all of David's mighty men, all these people who are closest to David, all of his best friends, turned on him and they were all saying, let's kill him. It's his fault, our family's gone. David, we're going to kill you. And they weren't, it wasn't hyperbole. And in this passage, I love the King James Version best. It said, David went off and encouraged himself in the Lord. 
He encouraged himself in the Lord. In the New Living Translation, um, it says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. See, we can be so dependent on one another and we can blame one another and we can say, well, my happiness is, is dependent on external things and on something or someone else. David went and found encouragement by himself in God. David encouraged himself in the Lord. He looked in the mirror and he said, God, it's you and me. I need you. Another passage, and just in case you aren't, I, I, I'm, I'm laying all these verses out for you because in our culture today, you know, we, we can say, well, let's just all feel good and it's all okay and it's great and it's not my fault, it's everybody else's fault, it's society, it's culture, it's teachers, it's school, it's churches, it's whatever. It's not my fault. I don't have responsibility. There's a lot of verses that speak to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Again, we can assume oh, our faith is fine. Eh. I go to church. I put money in the offering plate. I'll buy some stuff at an auction to help support the boilers. I'll volunteer maybe here and there, do a little something, and we think we're okay. Paul, writing the church of Corinth, says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Is it real? Has it changed you? Has it changed your life? Changed your mind? Changed the way you view life? Changed the way you view everything? Test yourselves. Is your faith true? Is your faith genuine and real? Is it? Only you can determine that. Psalm 119, 59. I pondered the direction of my life and I turned to follow your laws. I pondered the direction of my life. Anybody else ever done that before? <laughs> yeah, I have. And I turned to follow your laws. Haggai. One, five through seven, twice in these two, in these verses, he says, look at what's happening to you. So here's the prophet Haggai looking at the people. The people had just come back from exile. Their life was in shambles. Their cities were destroyed. And he says to them, look at what's happening to you. Don't you understand that where you are is because of your own behavior and your own choices? It's not anybody else's fault. It's your fault. You can't blame anyone else. Look at what's happening to you. Lamentations. Chapter 3, verse 40. We're not sure who wrote this, but we think it's Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, this whole letter of lament, and he writes this. Let us test and examine our ways. Let us turn back to the Lord. That we have to test and examine ourselves. I'm going to assume positive intent, but I can't. We also know what happens when you assume. Am I right? Are my intentions good? Is my behavior appropriate? Is my faith real? Am I leading my family the way I'm supposed to? Am I living my life the way I'm supposed to? Am I walking through this life exemplifying and reflecting who Jesus is? Examine yourself. Galatians 6, 4. You see, we got both Old Testament and New Testament chiming in here on this. 6, 4. Pay careful attention to your own work. Oh boy, we're good at this, aren't we? We are good at pointing out the flaws of other people. Oh, your kids, and oh, your children, and oh, your life, and oh, you know, if it, that employee, and this employee, and well, they did this, and they said that. Can't tell that person anything because they'll gossip. How many times have we shared something that we shouldn't have shared? That person's a thief, but we just took something from the office. 
We are so good at blaming and looking at other people's lives that we don't look at our own. We don't evaluate ourselves. Pay careful attention to your own work. And Jesus' words himself, when he says, take the speck out of your own eye before you try and remove the log in somebody else's eye. Jesus is telling his disciples, he's telling his followers, hey, you got your own problems to worry about. Now that doesn't mean we're not involved in each other's lives. None of this, that's not what this means because it's obvious throughout all of the Bible that we are involved in one another's lives. But we've got to start in the mirror. We've got to start with our faith and looking at our own faith in the mirror. We've got to start our own family by looking in the mirror. We've got to start with our own life and, well, that person's a hypocrite and that person's a hypocrite. And you might be right, but the truth is is you probably are too because I know I am. I'll be the first to admit the church is full of hypocrites and I'm one of them. I don't want to be. My intentions are good. My desire is right. But, ah, man, I don't live it. I want to. Oh, I mess up all the time. And I've got to start with me. I've got to start with my life and my faith and my family and my walk with Jesus. And it's hard looking in the mirror and seeing something you don't like. It's hard looking and and seeing a behavior and attitude that you don't like and you know is not godly. And you know it doesn't reflect him well. I I love Paul. (laughs) I love Paul who says, follow me as I follow Christ. Man, I've said that to people and I say it cringing, but I want to be such an example. Yet I know I fall and if I fail so much, it's like, oh. And Paul did. But he was passionate about changing. He was passionate about his prayer. And David, we can look at David's life and it's so easy to point out the mistakes. It's so easy to go back to Bathsheba and to go back to that sin and go back to that attitude and say, oh, David, you're such a loser. But his heart in Psalm 139, of God, please point out to me. Help me to see my faults. Help me to see my failures. God, I want to be like you. God, change me. When was the last time that we as a church, you as a person, as a family, got on your knees and your face before God, you cried out and said, God, please show me my mistakes. Show me where I'm wrong. Show me how to change. Show me how to be different. So that when we flip-flop along when we are walking through our life and we're walking through work and we're walking through our communities and we're walking through Meyer or Walmart or Home Depot or wherever and we're living our life that we look like Jesus that we act like Jesus that we talk like Jesus first John 2 6 you say you love Jesus, you have to live like him. You have to live like him. When we look at our faith, our family, flip-flops, and that's my, you know, as we live our life, as we just, as we live, as we get up and as we sit down and as we go out and as we come home, everything that we do, Are you reflecting on your faith, your family, your flip-flops? Are you praying, God, please reveal yourself to me. Show me my mistakes. Show me my faults. Show me my failures. Help me to be more like you. It is so easy to blame others. It is so easy to blame circumstances. I... (laughs) I, I, I'm tired of hearing the church blaming COVID because it gives us an excuse. It gives us an excuse to stay home. It gives us an excuse to not do this or to not do that because of COVID. 
Well, my schedule, I'm busy. Oh, that's an excuse. Don't give me your busy, we're all busy. There, see, there's that personality of, of not caring. I'm just going to steamroll out, you know. I'm not going to have fun. I'm just going to tell you how it is. And then I'll kind of feel bad for a minute, and then I'll feel guilty for feeling bad, and then I'll... Me, me complex. I'm telling you, it's terrible. But we, we blame so easy everything else around us for how we are and the way our life is and our faith and our lack of a relationship with Jesus. And we haven't even looked in the mirror. I think the Bible, this passage, this talk this morning is all about holding a mirror up to your life and your face and saying, what about you? Not anybody else. It doesn't matter about anybody else. What about you? What's your faith? What's your family? How's your walk? Is it genuine? Is it real? Is it true? Are you open to correction? Are you open to teaching? Are you open to rebuke? Are you open to these things? The Bible makes it very clear from Old Testament to New Testament that this, this, this is what, it's where we have to start. Jesus' words himself. What about the speck in your own eye? Are we taking out that speck? Are we looking at that? Church, if we're going to be the church, if we're going to have the, the families that we want, if we're going to have the walk that we desire, if we're going to have the faith that God requires of us, we have to start in the mirror. Does your life look like Jesus's? Does your attitude look like Jesus's? And good intentions aren't good enough. That we have to be different, church. We have to be different. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus and you don't have a relationship with him and, and, and you want to blame all the hypocrites in the church, you have a lot to go on. <laughs> There's a lot of us, and we do a really horrible job of reflecting Jesus to people around us. We do a terrible job of that. We do a terrible job of living out our mission of being all in because we're not most of the time. Forgive us. But also, if you don't know Jesus and you're trying to blame somebody else, you need to stop. Because whether I look like Jesus and my faith is perfect, it still depends on you. It still depends on how you live your life and the relationship that you have with Jesus yourself. And you can't go through life blaming other people. So if you don't know Jesus today, let me hold a mirror up to your life. Say, don't worry about anybody else. What about you? It's not comfortable and I know it. And I'm not apologizing for it. We're going to close. We're going to go. We're going to eat some really good food. If you're like me, you're going to eat way too much. Probably spend too much money. But when you leave this place, I'm going to assume positive intent. I'm going to assume the best of you. Other people might too, but is your faith genuine? Is your walk genuine? The altars are open. If you want to pray by yourself, I invite you over to this side. If you want somebody to pray with you, I invite you over to this side. If you want to come and pray and just say, you know, Lord, you want to say what David did. Point out anything in me that offends you. Is there anything in me that offends you? Is there anything in my life that's not like you? and you just want to have that personal conversation with him, you can do that where you are, and that's fine. But if you want to come and just, just you and him, I'm going to invite you to the side. If you want somebody to pray with you, I'm going to ask you to come over here and somebody will join you and pray with you or at least put their hand on you. This is serious stuff. Look it in the mirror. How is your life? You look like Jesus. Church, you need to be better. Let's stand and let's close with this song.